let me introduce you to William Normatas, uh, talk on how to survive algorithms in Scala. Over to you, William. Perfect. Thank you, Sal, so much. Uh, you've organized so many amazing events, and I'm glad to be one of in one of these. Uh, so yeah, I'm just gonna share my screen and start the slides. So sharing my screen. I don't know how much delay there is between Twitch and okay, I see it. That's perfect. Uh, so yeah, hi, um, I'm William. Uh, I've been programming with Scala for over seven years now. And uh, more recently, I got into algorithms in Scala and, and came up with something called Scala algorithms. But I'll, I'll go uh, go in a bit more on my uh, background uh, background on algorithms uh, and and share some more about uh, how to do this in Scala. So this talk is for anybody in programming. You don't have to be a Scala person, but uh, or you could be an algo with like completely, I think it's completely accessible to, to everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk about some programmatic motivations uh, behind algorithms in Scala and algorithms in general, uh, and then challenges with algorithms in Scala, because there are some. Uh, also, I'm going to talk about uh, how to survive uh, algorithms in Scala, in particular, uh, how Scala helped uh, do algorithms in some cases because it has uh, some advantages that other programming languages don't have. And, and finally, uh, a short introduction to Scala algorithms. So one of the things that's uh, really kind of pushed me towards uh, learning algorithms in more depth was um, Bartosz Milewski's talk at uh, Haskell Confi, uh, replacing functions with data. And this this you know, this has been, uh, I think, coming up quite a lot. I found when you have recursive functions that you're dealing with and then they, they, you know, get a stack overflow exception, like, what do you do? Like you reach a certain amount, you know, you reach a hundred items or a hundred levels of recursion, and then you get this, you know, really frustrating stack overflow error, which inspired the creation of stackoverflow.com. So, um, yeah, there is a way to do it. And it is, uh, it is quite a, quite an involved thing uh, and it does connect to how compilers are done and it, it does it does have uh, even day-to-day -day applications um, and uh, implications of how how to think about algorithms so that that was one of the things that uh, you know really pushed me uh, towards it uh, but also I think I really wanted to build up my arsenal of different skills uh, when dealing with Scala I found there were times that uh, you know, I would think, oh, you know, binary tree is so easy to do. And then I'm like stuck on a question for hours. Uh, so I thought, you know, let's, you know, let's tackle the, the bull head on, so to speak. Uh, so I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, also, what was interesting was I, I couldn't really find a concrete explanation of what algorithms are. Uh, so a lot of the time it's said that an algorithm is a set of instructions, but um, that's not quite the case. Uh, you can have any recipe, a, a, reci a recipe is a set of instructions. So what makes an algorithm distinct from a recipe? And it's really about dealing with efficiency under constraints. Uh, so one of the primary constraints is dealing with a lot of data uh, under limited time. So that includes CPU time and limited RAM. So in particular, uh, it becomes very important to, uh, to use high performance algorithms um, when you have, uh, you know, you have those limited resources. You could have an algorithm running in, in IoT devices. You can have an algorithm running in a web application and you could have you know, search that needs to respond you know, within milliseconds. So all of these things come through in algorithms uh, and they give you you know, there, there are some basic examples of algorithms, uh, but uh, there are more complicated ones. So you, you may, you probably have heard of binary search, uh, computing a streaming median of numbers. So when you have uh, data coming in continuously and you want to emit the median of that data for, uh, for whatever reason, for example, you know, to see what is the most common uh, request type, for example. Um, checking balanced parentheses how oh, this is this is so important as programmers we have different types of parentheses we deal with uh, i guess not so much when we get into scala 3 
uh, but nonetheless, uh, even in Scala, we have you know, we have rounded brackets, we have curly braces, and in, in other languages like Python, we also have you know we have square brackets. Uh, so really important, something you use every day. And if it were slow, your ID experience would be would be much much worse. Uh, merge sort and other types of sorts uh, they allow you to sort uh, data uh, sort data very very efficiently. Uh, faster than what you would be able to do if you just uh, did in the YIV sort. Uh, run length encoding, encryption, compression, decompression, um, super important topics. Again, uh, these are optimizations that we benefit from uh, every day. So our computers are jam-packed with algorithms. We just don't see it, they're abstracted away. And all we can say as users is, wow, this is so fast. Or, if there isn't a good algorithm in place, and you know, you would say, "Oh, this is really slow." So, why why is it important to understand algorithms? Now, the the there are many many engineers who work with uh, web applications in, in different situations, and they 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 don't really uh, come across the need for algorithms, but that is typically more useful when you deal with a big amount big amounts of data and um things that where you really really need that that ability to just respond instantaneously there is a big difference between uh, data results that you can get in 30 seconds versus 30 minutes and likewise between 30 seconds and one second and half a second uh, it makes all of the difference so um even if you learned an algorithm by itself uh, it doesn't mean that uh, you would be able to necessarily deal with variations because I, I found that uh, actually there are quite a few variations in your specific uh, programs that you deal with, uh, where if you didn't understand the algorithm, it would um, be very, very challenging to come up with a slight modification to your algorithm. So this is where and that understanding is really, really important. Um, in distributed computation, of big data, you may, uh, for example, need to uh, share the data across different uh, devices, or perhaps um, one, one interesting thing uh, with algorithms is, uh, I've, I've faced this interview question, is like, how do you sort a 100 gigabyte file, uh, given you have 16 gigabytes of RAM, that sort of question. And, and it does become, a, uh, I have faced this as a, as a real old problem, uh, when you have like, millions of events like every day and then you want to sort these events across uh across you know multiple days maybe even a year worth of data and you need to do it fast um the other use case is, is high performance uh, local optimization so you don't necessarily distribute but actually you just need to get a result out really quickly it could be like finding a shortest path and that sort of thing so Challenges uh, with algorithms. Uh, when I started, uh, I was already quite experienced in Scala when starting algorithms, and I hadn't really covered alg algorithms in the past. So uh, while I was studying, I found that uh, I couldn't really find many resources for uh, doing it in Scala. Uh, a lot of, uh, well, pretty much all resources that I found would be uh, written in Python or Java or C++ and uh, they use a lot of mutability and array indices and that sort of thing. And this was uh, one of the things that I learned about Scala is you don't, you don't need to go so level. You can actually write your algorithms in a, in a higher level way uh, that you can't necessarily do so easily in, in other languages. Uh, so there, there was an issue of comprehension where uh, trying to comprehend an algorithm that is uh, so verbose is, well, it's, it's just time consuming and ideally you just like to get it done more quickly. Um, so you need something that is very readable thinking from the perspective of not just, you know, you shouldn't have just a write only code. You should really think about, you know, is, is your code comprehensible for, for the next person to read? Um, correctness. Uh, one of the other challenges was correctness. Uh, an algorithm may work for some data, but may not necessarily work for other data. So um, you have to 
test and test and test. Like testing is actually really important because, uh, for example, if you decided to, uh, you know, you, you had only one test case or two test cases, and you you wrote a piece of code, maybe you're submitting it to Codility or something for your interview, and after you submitted it, you realize, oh, they're testing for this extreme edge case, and suddenly now you, you don't have, you know, you don't have the hundred percent that you thought you would. So. Um, yeah, test case is super important. And obviously stack safety uh, and recursion. So this goes back to, to that talk on uh, functions as, uh, as data, uh, which is very, very cool. Um, and yeah, when, when, you, when you're recursing, especially like in a sorting algorithm, uh, you have to be mindful of how much data you can fit in. And is there a way for you to do something uh, non-recursively? And um, the basic answer, yes, there is, uh, it's just, are uh, not necessarily so so straightforward. So I'll go to the next slide. Uh, so after after quite a bit of pain in in in, in trying to uh, figure things out, uh, Scala algorithms did become fun, um, namely because of the rich standard library, uh, which provides you with a lot of met a lot of uh, utility methods that uh, you. You simply can't find in other programming languages. I have a in my next slide. I have uh, I have some comparisons. Um, immutability. So the thing with immutability really is, and and with the way Scala allows you to represent uh, data types, is you are far less likely to enter into a an invalid state. So with immutability, you kind of know. You, you start thinking in terms of transformation rather than mutation or changes. So your algorithm isn't so much like, oh, you know, a modif, he has a NIF statement and this modifies that other variable. And then once I've modified that, what is the effect on the next thing that, on the next, uh, on the next if statement and so forth? You don't really have to think about that. So you have, you have this more compositional approach where you, you know that, okay, this is my, initial view of the world and I've transformed it into the next uh, view of the world and from this you get a composition and a lot of elegance which is absolutely fantastic so uh, the standard library offers you some really really amazing things like when you do a, a binary search so this is an example from Rosetta code of a python piece uh, where you access the length of the list you minus one and then you set the low to zero, and and uh, which represents the first item in this list. And then you do a while comparison, and uh, you constantly keep on changing the bounds, which is basically a search range. And amazing, Scala gives you a range. So the way, how do I initiate this range is, well, I just say a dot indices, and this is all provided by Scala. And if I want to sort across uh, a generic list of items, Scala gives you this ordering of T, which then you can use. Immutability. Uh, so this is uh, another another piece of code. This is from Stack Overflow. It's, uh, I think, one of the algorithms to compare uh, uh, sequences of three. And typically in, in, a, in a language like Python, you would, uh, well, for example, you would generate a range based off of length of A, and then you would do a lot of uh, mutations. And it turns out that this algorithm, which, which was very much in the shape of like, I'm gonna mutate every single step of the way, it can be written fully in, uh, completely in a, an immutable style. And this is again where Scala's, um, oh, sorry, it's from Rosetta code. Uh, and, with Scala, you can really do some quite fantastic things like sliding um, zip with index that gives you the index of the item. And actually, really, really importantly, uh, your result types, they can be optional. So um, many algorithms I've come across in Python, they would give you like minus one, for example, if a re no result has been found. And I, um, obviously, as a consumer of this algorithm, you may not necessarily expect a minus one to come back uh, yet 
um, you will have to deal with it. Like it's, it's a magic constant, but if you can lift out this uh, success or failure into an actual type in Scala, this uh, gives the consumer of your function uh, that much more confidence of you know, what, does it, what does the result contain basically. Uh, so yeah, how, how do you survive in this Scala algorithms? Um, I, I think a lot of it could be applicable to it, to any other programming language, um, but really um, test cases. Test cases is the number one thing that you need to do. You need to think about the zero case, think about the one case, depending on the algorithm, you may need to think about the you know, uh, five case and then obviously the end case and then uh, infinity case let's say your input integers are perhaps could be int dot max value or something and then how do you deal with those um so the reason for an algorithm is really to find up a, uh, a lot of the time is to find a faster way of doing something now there are some algorithms which are just figuring out how to do something um but most of the time it's really about efficiency like how do you efficiently do this thing? How do you efficiently compare two strings rather than uh, doing it you know, in a, in a way that's five times as slow? Because in, in the end, it makes a difference. Like I've, I've dealt with applications where uh, if you use the na naive way of do, uh, processing like a 10 gigabytes uh, JSON file, you, you could end up taking like six minutes to process that file versus six seconds after optimizing it. So um, you, have a, you have a brute force way, which is always correct. And that is re it's really, really important to have that uh, because it allows you then to create uh, an implementation of your algorithm that is optimized and then compare the brute force with your optimized version using Scala check. The beauty of Scala check is that it will check different edges, different uh, cases. And if it finds that your optimization is wrong, it will also give you a reduced case. So you don't have to worry about um, you know, uh, dealing with a very complicated piece of input. It just gives you the minimum case to, to reproduce the error. And then from that, you can figure out, okay, ah, I see there's one case that I forgot about. Uh, so this is, uh, Scala check is, uh, I think it's inspired from uh, another library in uh, Haskell. Um, so I, I think for, you know, for these two languages, they have this amazing way of representing property checking. Uh, while other languages, they may have these things, um, I haven't actually checked, but I'm sure they are a lot more verbose or, or more challenging to use um, because just Scala check alone pulls in so many Scala features like type classes and, and generators and so forth. And the last thing, uh, really very specific to how you implement your algorithm and it's, it's, it's relevant to any programming language is allocating less. So if you can stream your data and you can do your comparisons or checks without creating a new data structure, for example, um, instead of saying list.map something, which would allocate a new list for you, you may want to say list.view, which doesn't allocate it. And it's only evaluated when it's needed. So this whole idea of lazy computation is extremely powerful. Um, again, Haskell and Scala, and of course, a few other programming languages uh, give you this ability. So you, you can really uh, write your algorithm in, in the most human readable way without having to um, suffer the performance cost. So in terms of, in terms of Scala itself, the most important concepts uh, I found were tail recursion. Um, tail recursion is basically the, whatever is tail recursive, you can write in a while loop. And whatever you can write in a while loop, you can make tail recursive. So Scala would compile it down. Eventually when it runs in a JVM, it would still be a while loop. 
but it is more readable and it is more obvious what is going on when you are doing a tail recursion as opposed to a while loop. And uh, one of the main tasks, like in learning an algorithm, uh, for example, you, you take it from a book, um, is really transforming from this while while loop, while mutable loop in particular, because it is very mutable, um, transforming from that into a purely functional way of doing something. And it just has that huge, huge benefit of, of readability and, and deco decomposability where you kind of know exactly which parameters are, are, are changing over time into your next call of the function. So it's, it's super, like it's, it's really super clear when your algorithm will end. And it's not always obvious in, in uh, you know, in Python where you, let's say you would have a while, something, if this, then break, if something else, then continue uh, and or return. So you have very clear isolation. Um, folds and scans are uh, hugely important. Uh, some of the most commonly used things, uh, they basically, for non scalar people, a, a fold is uh, effectively can do what a, a for each loop would do and give you a single result. And then a scan, it's, it's, it's a very close sibling, uh, would transform from a, a sequence into another sequence using incremental results. So for example, a fold uh, would be to sum all the numbers in a collection. So one plus two plus three plus four, that would be a fold and gives you a 10. But if you did a scan, what you could do is you can get a collection of, let's say your input was one, two, three, four, you can get the incremental uh, buildup. So effectively you would start with zero, then one, then three, then six, and 10. And this is your final result. So with a scan, you can uh, do, you can really do a lot. You can do these uh, prefix sums and that sort of thing. Um, but there are other ways to do prefix sums. Um, yeah, the next thing collects. Um, so I'll, I'll show a FizzBuzz example where collect is, is, is really super cool. Uh, collect is basically a filter plus a map. So if you are looping over your collection, so I'm just gonna speak in imperative terms. When you're looping for your collection and then you say, if something, give me something else based on that. Uh, and and this, this is collect and it's a, it's a single method um, it's a partial function. So uh, in Scala, partial function gives you a way to only extract the things that you are interested in and do a transformation on these things in a single call, which is super powerful. Now, the last important concept, I think, is, is the sliding concept. Uh, quite important for algorithms, uh, especially when you are comparing uh, pieces of data uh, that are next to each other. So you would, you could end up using all of these concepts in one implementation on the algorithm. Of course, it depends on the specific algorithm, but uh, these are the ones I found the most. Of course, as I mentioned previously, the, there is view, um, but I'll go into a bit more depth on that uh, a little bit later. So yeah, performance aspects. Uh, it's not slow. Scala is not slow. It's really, really fast. I, I, I know some people think immutability is is going to cause issues, but really, it, it doesn't cause issues. Uh, I've been able to achieve, as, as I mentioned, like reading a processing, not just reading, processing a uh, you know six gigabyte file in three seconds. You can do that in Scala in an immutable way of all things. Typically, it's just... Um, the biggest enemy is allocations. So using choosing the wrong data structure, maybe you should have been using a vector rather than a list, or maybe uh, you should, you know, you should uh, make sure that you use dot view. The real thing about algorithms is not uh, comparing one language with another. It's really about 
um, can you achieve huge gains in performance that are based on a data size? So an algorithm in one language and, an, and the same algorithm in another language, they will, um, perf the, the, the performance difference between them will pretty much remain constant, but compared to a poor algorithm for the same problem, um, this is what you're really looking at to optimize. So yeah, uh, any questions before I, I go into this? Let's see on the Twitch crowd. So somebody mentioned competitive programming. I think for competitive programming, I would love Scala to get into that. Scala is currently, I, I haven't really seen Scala very much on competitive programming. Uh, it's typically C and then C++ and Python. Um, but maybe one day, uh, I, I hope to, I hope is, my hope is that Scala becomes uh, a language that people do consider for doing, uh, you know, those complicated algorithmic problems. It's just there, are, there aren't many uh, resources for that. Okay. I think that would be all the questions that I see unless my Twitch is a bit uh, laggy. Uh, do you have any, any other questions, uh, Seller? No, I don't see any other questions at the moment. All right, perfect. We can so, carry on. Awesome. So yeah, I'll get on with a short demonstration. Well, someone just said they got a question. I don't know if you want to wait uh, <laughs> before we before doing that. Whether we should carry on till the next point. Will you give examples of sliding? Absolutely. Best way All to right. transform an element at index. Great. So, um, Santa Watch, if, what do you mean transform element at index? And, and um, yeah, while Santa is answering. Um, ah, I see, I see. It depends on the data structure. Uh, so, with uh, Scala list, uh, it's it's really the the most like it's it's not, updating a Scala list is not the most fast thing you can do because uh, you would be creating a new list. Uh, so typically you would say list dot. Um, actually, let's see if Demogod is uh, able to help us. So um, if we log on to the Scala uh, algorithms ID, so there is this ID that gives you let's see if it works i'm just gonna need to uh, are you able to see my screen from here uh you may need to share a different desktop on zoom yeah, yeah. Uh, or um if you share an entire desktop, then you, you can um, switch back and forth between the two of course let me just share now Okay, should be able to see this. Perfect. Yeah, so uh, on, on Scala algorithms, we have this. For some reason, when I'm sharing, I can't use my keyboard anymore, which is very, very odd. Ah, yeah, to take, take your time, you should be able to do it. Works. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so in order to update something at, at an index, uh, depending on what other stages you have, you would typically do something like uh, list dot updated. That is that is one way. Of course, it's, it's not necessarily the most efficient. ID X and then list ID X and then you have an F of that. Now, this is not efficient. And the reason why is because looking up in a list uh, is an O of N operation. And then updating a list, also you uh, have to go through this list. So in Scala, the, depending on what you are doing, but typically I would do a view if your transformation has more than one stage, I, I would do dot view dot zip with index. And then with that zip, then you can map 
and then you can say case uh, item. Then you can say, choose this particular index. And then for that index, you can update the item with your F. And then for any other item, you don't do the transformation. And this would give you that uh, transformation here. Um, but if, if, yeah, you would need to do the dot zip with index because if you didn't do, so if you didn't do the view, what you would end up doing, while well, you don't have to use dot view dot two list, what you would end up doing is creating another list here and then creating yet another list as you map it. So uh, not necessarily the most efficient thing. So this is where the view concept is, is very important. So uh, we had a question also from Igor. Um, so on Scala algorithms, basically through my uh, work with algorithms, I, I, I isolated some important concepts and some of them were, um, one of them was view. So if you have a an example to, to work with, you can basically see that, okay, you know, if, if I do my view, you know, how does it work? What side effects does it have? And so forth. Like here we have a proof that, you know, view is, is, um, is lazy. And the beauty of Scala is that you can still do imperative programming or side effecting programming uh, where you need to, you don't need to do anything special. Uh, so here, um, yeah, you have the view you have a modification happening and then you have a you have a evaluation happening um, for for Igor if we go to another concept and that's the sliding window concept uh, really really important and if i run it in the ide now you can do sliding window on on lists you can do it on iterators pretty much any scala any scala collection and yeah you you get you know, you get items that are basically next to each other. You can choose two, you can choose three. If I change it to three, then this test will fail. The reason why is because instead of having these three items in a list, now we got two uh, of length three. So yeah, I, I hope you I hope you have a look at this, Igor. And yeah, let's uh let's go into the Scala algorithms itself. Uh so yeah, it's a collection of well, I'm, I'm aiming towards 100 algorithms, uh, but basically right now we have 77 algorithms. Uh, they, most of them are published. Uh, some of them are free. So, and the rest, uh, the rest basically have those test cases for you to deal with. So I'll just log out to demonstrate how it looks to everyone. Uh, so yeah, you have, uh, you have, algorithms that you have full solutions to uh, and some of the more complicated ones for example the run uh, run length encoding um, you get you get a test cases so normally you have enough information for you to start with so the reason the main difficulty I found was that there are no test cases online for algorithms like you can't really verify your solution and this here allows you to to verify those test cases for yourself. So if, if uh, for example, I'm just gonna do one W as a result uh, and we should see one of the tests pass. I, I know I hard coded it, but yeah, you, you get a template that you can work with and then you get test cases and you, you can incrementally um, work out a solution and then be, you know, have confidence that it is indeed the right solution. Uh, this ID has a, cool feature that it saves your work so you can just exit it and then come back to it later saves it in your browser though and if you want to have more runs just uh, register it is uh, it's free to register to get unlimited runs in the IDE if uh, if there is a an algorithm in particular you're interested you can just uh, go for that uh, but you're welcome also to sign up for the unlimited membership so yeah I think this is um what else should I go through? Yeah, we have test cases, explanations, uh, and the algorithm itself, as well as all of the relevant concepts. So for example, if you go back to the maximum potential profit, 
uh, piece of code. You have all of the different Scala concepts that you should uh, be aware of when approaching this solution. And uh, this list of concepts is provided for everyone. Uh, so yes, yeah, scan left, scan right. You can see exactly what to do here. Um, and what else would I like to share about this? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm just going to share the full screen now. How can I share the full screen? I think I need to exit the sharing and then start afresh. Okay. For some reason, I can't see a way to share a full screen. Um, which is very, very, very unexpected. Um, we click, click the arrow next to the share screen button. There's a little arrow. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, no, press, when you press the, uh, let me just see. What, uh, you should be able to just like you did earlier. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Uh, yeah. Well, um, very, very strange, but uh, I'll just go back to sharing this this one screen. Uh, yeah, if, if there's, you know, let me know if there's any algorithms that you're interested in uh, publishing more quickly. I have a schedule, um, but I'm happy to change that. If there's any algorithm anybody is interested in, I'm, I'm happy to work out, work that out. Uh, we have a calendar, so if you have Google calendars, you click here, or if you have an uh, iPhone or a Mac, you can click here and it will show up immediately uh, on your um, on your local calendar. So you know you can just uh, you know what to expect when and. Yeah, my, my hope really with, with Scala algorithms is that uh, it's really brings Scala into this territory of, you know, oh, we want to do like complicated algorithmic trading and whatnot. Like uh, I even spoke recently with a company who wants to migrate um, some of the code to C++ for performance reasons. And I'm thinking, well, soon you won't have to because of Scala. Um, yeah, so let's uh, look at the questions. How does the IDE work? What's actually running the code? Uh, so it's using the Scala reflect code, um, more specifically the Scala compiler. So it just compiles it and runs it. Uh, in terms of dealing with, in terms of um, the infrastructure, it's, it's uh, RabbitMQ plus a uh, dedicated Scala app. And yeah, there's, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's a small like assertions framework that, that you can see um, just, just to pass what the assertion does. Nice. Uh, so, so what this means actually, that there's a huge advantage. You, you don't like, you can just copy paste this code straight away into your Scala REPL. If you want to, you don't have, you know, you don't have to use this ID. So it's it's really portable. Like your assertions are portable between like you want to do Scala test, yeah, just copy paste this. You want to do it in the REPL, you can copy paste this. Like I, I in my time with Scala, I basically went from using all these uh fancy uh should be matches and everything just into plain assertions because you can the benefit of plain assertions is you, you can just analyze them so much more easily and they are just that much more uh, consistent because you can you can literally pull your assertion into anywhere in, in your Scala code and it's, um, this allows you to even have tests right next to your main code uh, that you know a testing framework wouldn't necessarily give. Okay, uh, if most things are immutable, data is in heap, I believe this causes problem of performance and maybe there could be better options or using default GM GVM settings are okay. Uh, the defaults are okay. Um, basically behind the scenes, there may be a lot of stuff going on to make it fast. I, I really haven't come across performance issues like even updating a, a Scala map is not slow. And the JVM does an amazing job in optimizing stuff. So, uh, if you find some something super unperformant, actually just 
message me, you can press contact here and just send me. I'm, I would be quite curious um, because I, I think that this would um, this would be interesting cases to look at. Uh, and I'm always sure that there is a way to optimize it. I really have like I dealt with some very high performance applications in Scala and um, you know, you may have to go all the way to, to using like uh, unsafe code, but you can still be pure functional and it can still be immutable. Next question. Uh, curious about how multi-core architecture overlaps with algorithms, other techniques for increasing cache hits, for example. Uh, yes, there are. So really, really good question. Uh, with uh, with lazy programming, uh, now I, I don't know the details of how they do it, but um, basically you get a whole stage fusion. So if you had um, if you had a piece of code that has um, multiple stages, so let's just see if we can find something. Uh, yeah, I think this one is, is is a good example. If yeah, if you have a piece of code that has multiple stages, um, doo -doo -doo -doo, let's see. Actually, I think this one I, I can optimize a bit more. Uh, if you have those multiple stages, then um, each stage would be executed immediately one after another for every individual could be uh, executed Im immediately one after another. And then from that sense, uh, you could have, um, you wouldn't have to even do like cache. Uh, you wouldn't have to be populating your cache because of every stage in your transformation, simply because you decide like to do dot view on your collection. Uh, yeah, there are techniques for increasing cache hits. I think it's it's quite a niche topic. Um, if you can uh, drop me a message on Twitter or, or from the Scala algorithms website, I would be more interested in, in your use case um, on, on the aspect of multi-core architecture. Um, I found that if you try to make your code immutable and run really performantly in a single thread, you may not. You may actually have worse performance if you try to make it multi-core. Um, again, it depends on the particular use case. Um, so, yeah, let let me know. I, I would be quite curious, and you know, to to come up with some material on that because um, you can process like twenty gigabytes of data a second on Scala if you want to. What else? Uh, one J Pablo one says, is your goal to help people learn how to write high performance Scala code or high performance functional code? Uh, so high performance Scala code, I think it's a little bit of a different topic. Uh, it does intersect with algorithms, but it's not exactly algorithms. Uh, my goal is that Scala does become a language in which you can do algorithms in a, a native Scala way. At the moment, uh, many solutions I would find for algorithms in Scala, they, uh, they may be either mutable or very inefficient or just, just difficult to read. And I think that um, to have this resource should uh, encourage people more to just you know, not, not go back to Python or not go back to Java. It's really, it's really like about uh, the retention and also about, uh, you know, bringing people in and showing, hey, you can do this algorithm in a way more comprehensive way, a comprehensible way. Like if I, if I, you know, if I just Google this. Stock buy, sell to maximize profit. Like this is the code that you're, you know, you're, I'm gonna consent to that. Like this is this is a very different type of code that you're dealing with when you're doing immuta, uh, mutability or compare like you're dealing with indices, uh, making sure that you don't escape your array, you don't get indexed out of bounds or incrementing stuff like, um, and yeah, just just doing a lot of complicated stuff. And the, you know the answer is: Do you really need to? Can you just separate your problem into multiple simple stages? So. Yes and no. Uh, 
but also from the aspect of actual applications. Um, it really, it really depends on general performance optimization because algorithms are just one way to do performance optimization. And yeah, I, I love performance optimization and Scala can achieve amazing things, um, but I will probably write separate resources for that. Okay, I think, um, I think that would be all for the questions. Uh, I don't know if there's anything you would like to ask Seller. I think we're just reached the 45 minutes. Oh, that's great. Um, um, let's see, does anyone have uh, questions? Uh, can you briefly, did you look at the last one? And um, can you briefly share what your six gig gigabyte in three seconds example was and what sort of work did you have to do to get it to that point? Oh, that's an amazing question, yes. Uh, so this um, is an online gaming platform uh, that I was building called Action FPS. It's uh, for a very, very simple open source game. And in there, uh, you are basically uh, processing a lot of streaming data. So it's just one big uh, TSV plus JSON file, uh, which has all of the information of what happened in, in, uh, in many, many games. And yeah, it, it it was really it was really really interesting. The first uh, before I got to problems with reading full strings and splitting strings, uh, I had to first uh, figure out all of my uh, data structures, so allocations. And for that, I would use uh, the SBT JMH library. So there's a nice tutorial, and this is this is made by Conrad and and team, uh, and this allows you to view. Let me see if there's a screenshot. Uh, there isn't a screenshot, but you can import the results in a nice into a nice GUI and basically see where um, your performance bottlenecks are. So uh, if you can reduce your allocations and just doing unnecessary work when when processing the data, because the fastest thing you can do is reduce your allocations and skip over the data that you're not interested in, um, that is a huge benefit. The next thing is, well, I, again, it's allocation related. As you're reading uh, data out, uh, you are creating strings, for example. Um, but you, what you can do instead of creating strings is to read this uh, data uh, byte by <coughs> byte and, and computing um, on that and changing your code to deal with that uh, can give you an amazing performance boost. Um, so how do you do that? Uh, you have um, something called random uh, file. I forgot the exact name. Uh, random file Java reads memory. Basically it's a memory mapped file. So random access file. Um, yeah, great question on Stack Overflow. Does it read the whole file in memory? Uh, no, it doesn't read it in memory. It's, it just seeks very, very, uh, very, very quickly to the piece of um, to the piece you're interested in, and then from there, you can read this whole file in in a, in an immutable way. Like you, d you don't have to say like, oh, seek. Instead, you you create an abstraction in in, in Scala that just says, I want to seek this next. And then you have a separate interpreter. So this is where the whole idea of interpreters is really important. Uh, yeah, so reducing allocations, skipping over the stuff you're not interested in, and, and just getting down to the lowest level, which is uh, reading data directly. You can read data directly from, you know, uh, from a file. And because it's, it's memory mapped, like it, you don't have to read the whole file in advance and you just you just get that reading straight from a RAM, uh, RAM type of thing. Um, you can also do other cool things uh, using the Java uh, IO libraries, um, but I think that would be a topic for another talk. So I think uh, that would be all for the questions. I would like to, yeah, th thank you, Salar, and thank you so much uh, for the uh, to the 50 viewers that are looking at this and also really, really good questions. I will, I will save these questions and see if I can come up with something. Um,
to go into a bit more depth. But yeah, I, I hope that uh, yeah, I hope that Scala algorithms does uh, does enhance Scala as much as possible. Um, and and yeah, for those for those interested, just if you have any questions or, or ideas or requests, uh, just let me know. And yeah, on Twitter or uh, for the contact form I have, and then I'll be I'll be happy to yeah, I'll be have I'll be happy to have a look at it. Thank you so much. Thanks, William. Really appreciate you doing this talk. It was awesome.